we have to give you a story. Uh, we were having a chat with Dominika just after GeekCon, and uh, then Dominika said that she really would love to have a presentation at Confitura because she's been an organizer of this an amazing of this amazing event for years. Just a volunteer. Uh, <laughs> that counts as an organizer. You spend your blood and sweat and tears, and the event <laughs> happens. <laughs> uh, and she wanted to have a talk, and. Uh, we were both slightly exhausted after GeekCon, <laughs> and uh, here we are. <laughs> so, th I believe this is her first appearance on the conference stage ever. Yeah. Uh, so, a loud, wide, big round of applause to Dominika. <laughs> <laughs> and now we can start. Uh, so, the talk is, what do I do with a thousand calls? Uh, our names are here. Uh, I believe the talk is recorded. Uh, so if you need any slides, you can email us, you can tweet at us, and we will be more than happy to share the slides with you. Uh, no need to take pictures. Uh, if you want to tweet, of course, go ahead. If you want to do something else, just be respectable of other people. Uh, and about us. Uh, this is Dominika. She has a Twitter, <laughs> and I think she can introduce herself. Where do you work? What do you do? I work for Affinity. We are doing um, a platform to sell insurances. So that's basically that. <laughs> uh, so you write code on a daily basis? Yeah. And Java? Sometimes. Yeah. So I prefer Kotlin, <laughs> if you want to know. <laughs> your choice. <laughs> uh, and my name is Andrzej. I have a Twitter and so on. Uh, I'm currently a very highly paid unemployed person. Uh, if you are very curious about this, this look up gardening live in the UK. Uh, that's why. Uh, I'm a Java champion, have been a Java rock star at the blah, moment. Blah, blah, uh, blah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, people who know me know me. People who don't know me, my bio won't change your inf <laughs> the things that you will learn here. Disclaimer. The opinions that we present are our own, which means we do not represent any organization whatsoever. Uh, and this picture is going to be slightly colored, so if you want to see, uh, this one will be better in terms of color, but this one is bigger, your choice. Uh, the aim of this talk is, uh, well... It's if almost you visible. <laughs> if you have a big machine, obviously you want the utilization of this machine to be as big as possible. Uh, if you cannot see anything because the lights are too bright and shining directly into the screen, or some other reason, uh, this is showing HTOP showing 99 something percent utilization across all the 128 cores, uh, which is generally something that we should strive for. Yeah. yeah. It means that the machines that you've paid for are being used, which is uh, a useful feature of a software, I could say. And this uh, is done by HTOP, which is an open source tool. You can have it on a Mac, I guess, on Windows. No idea. No idea. Yeah, no. Uh, well. On Linux, it works for sure. <laughs> uh, it's open source. It does uh, check everything once a minute, sorry, once a second, by scanning the uh, various files in the file system. So don't uh, look at it as a real-time online monitoring. It's just to give you a hint of what's happening in the system. And we love to start with some inspirational quote. I see some <laughs> people are smiling. That's very good. <laughs> And what we are going to talk about probably might not apply to a typical Spring, Hibernate, Kotlin, <laughs> uh, definitely not Node.js, definitely not Ruby uh, kind of application. Yeah, Th that text is supposed to be white, but doesn't matter. Uh, this is about a very special piece of software that was doing, I believe, agent-based simulations. Yeah. So agent-based simulations, which means trying to replicate what's happening in the world, very CPU expensive activity. Yeah. So you want to burn the CPUs and have coffee while it's running. Uh, even Spring PHP, uh, <laughs> nothing relevant. Who here remembers their first computer? I'll start with you, our new speaker. Yeah, I think it was some Intel Pentium, maybe. Wow. I'm not sure. But you remember having a first computer? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for me, that was an Intel 386. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, some of you might have started before that. Uh, let's do it in a different way. Intel users in the room, raise your hands. Yeah. AMD users in the room, raise your hands. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Any Threadripper users in the room? Nobody? 
Okay. And a trick question. A, a arm users in the room, raise your hands. People who have not raised your hands, who here has a mobile like an Android or an iPhone? Anybody? Uh, a hint, it runs on ARM. Uh, if you have a, a Switch? Yes, Nintendo Switch console, yes, also. Uh, <laughs> that runs NVIDIA Tegra, which is an integrated something, something that includes ARM. And soon, well, already, you can have ARM-based machines on Amazon. So if your production runs on Amazon, <laughs> oh, well. you get ARMs. <laughs> well, there is a saying, or a curse, by... According to Terry Pratchett, it's a Chinese thing. Uh, <laughs> may you live in interesting times. I believe uh, if you look at what's happening to CPUs, we do live in interesting times. And somebody was kind enough to come up with this awesome chart. Oh, well. <laughs> I think what the arrow is pointing out is that frequency kind of plateaued. Yeah. Uh, interesting, isn't it? <laughs> it's interesting, but... I'm I'm curious. I was really hoping to see six gigahertz or seven gigahertz in a in a CPU, and then nothing. Well, you can get five now, uh, but uh, what happens instead is uh, watts stopped increasing as well. So CPU still only can brew you a coffee if you wait long enough, and no nothing more. So what's what's happening here? That's an interesting question, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> well, uh, we uh, have. <laughs> I guess you're trying to say increasing core counts. Yeah, <laughs> we have increasing core so counts. So how many cores do you have in your desktop? Um, cores, I think eight. So eight cores. Uh, how many in your phone? I think eight. <laughs> this, is, this is crazy. <laughs> so uh, you probably have noticed that frequencies plateaued. Typical power in a per CPU has plateaued. Instead, where we gain performance gains is number of cores. Uh, the craziest machines we were able to find on Azure uh, are these. You get 20 Intel Xeon E78890 V4 CPUs, which gives you 480 CPU cores, uh, which after hyper-threading, if you're not afraid of Spectre, you can get 960 CPU threads after hyper-threading. I'll let that sink in. Uh, 480 cores, 960 threads. That's a lot. Uh, and then there is this Microsoft test machine where, where they test Microsoft Windows kernel. Not that I use Windows heavily, it's just an interesting thing they did. And they have 1792 BV cores, which means over a thousand. I don't know about you, but my university did not prepare me to write software for anything above a few. Did yours? Not really. No. So yeah, let's have a look at supercomputers. Year 2010, June, position number 37. We get 12, 1280 cores to be on the to be the 37th fastest supercomputer on Earth. 1200 cores. Easy, isn't it? Easy. <laughs> if we look at the machines that we've seen, well, you buy two and you have more already. Uh, of course, time has moved on. So currently, the leaders are around 2. Point, almost 2.5 million cores, and so on and so on and so on, details. Uh, which brings us to an interesting thing that we want to and have to talk about, because that's going to bite us, and that's going to bite us even harder and harder. Yeah, non-uniform memory access is the thing <laughs> uh, that we need to think about, uh, because not all cores uh, have the same access to memory, and uh, they, are uh <laughs> they have uh, so, well, uh, it's easier to get from to, to some memory part from one, one core than from another core. So, oh. the typical workstation, and the typical workstation with arrows pointing at, at things. Uh, yeah, the colors are look different enough. Mm. So, if you have a two CPU workstation, this is probably what you might have. It's a generic picture out of the internet, but the architecture will be similar. You'll have RAM associated with one CPU, and then you'll have RAM associated with the other CPU. And if, then if you want to talk to one to another, you have to, well, do funny things. 
It's not. It's a shortcut. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a shortcut. It's a shortcut. It's uh, well, it's, it's the only way because you, you you cannot cheat physics. You cannot cheat light speed, and uh, you have to pass uh, different different in the connects. It depends on which manufacturer and which era you're looking at. But if you have a workstation like that, you can use NUMA CTL to tell you what kind of hardware you're running on. And if you look at the traditional Xeon. Uh, there is a nice Linux tool called LS Topo, which will show you and print out a nice PNG with the architecture of, the, of a CPU, or two, a, a two CPU machine. Uh, it has all the cores. It has all the hyper-threaded cores. And zoomed in, it doesn't look much bigger. <laughs> but if you want to have a look at core number zero, here it is. Uh, and it's pa paired with core number 28, which is the hyper-threaded sibling of it. So if you are on, let's say, Amazon, if you want to not use the hyper-threaded cores, uh, you can just bind your software to core number 0, 1, 2, and so on, and so on, to basic to the, to the first half. So if you have two single-threaded pieces of software, what can you do? Well, you can let the operating system figure it out. And then where will it run? Somewhere. <laughs> Somewhere. Well, basic, that, that's, that's correct. It, it, the operating system can shuffle it around, can interleave it with other pieces of software. Can, can move it from core to core. Can Why move not? It. <laughs> can it do cross domains across Numa? Maybe, because you didn't say anything. So if you want to run software that is good at running a single threaded workload, you want to isolate it to a single core. Why? Because uh, each core, each physical core, will have its own L1 cache for instructions for data, its own L2 cache. And you can see from this diagram, or if you are interested and want to look at the slides, the L3 cache is shared in the package. And then the right question would be, how does it affect me? Especially if uh, in professional capacity you are in that situation that you are writing software on something like this that we are presenting from. So I write my code on a MacBook, leave me in peace. So let's run a benchmark. Uh, the benchmark, it doesn't matter really what it does. Uh, the gist is more is better, same shape of a symbol means the same benchmark. And we have two machines. We have a MacBook, machine M, and we have a workstation which is uh, called machine Z in the bottom row. What can we see? I'll give you a hint. <laughs> the things have flipped. Not only uh, does the MacBook CPU look faster, but what is fa which benchmark runs faster, faster on which uh, architecture? That's the opposite. Uh, it would be useful to know what exactly was, r was running, but what we wanted to illustrate here is uh, the architecture of what is being run affects the software heavily. If you have something that's single-threaded, <laughs> or if you want to play a game, recent yeah. CPUs do something very interesting. Yeah, um, the thread reapers uh, can uh, have a game mode where they, uh, well, they disable <laughs> nodes. Just uh, they are just run one uh, dice. So that's faster because the access to memory is faster. <laughs> and there is also built-in overclocking in CPUs. Yeah. So. If you're running a single-threaded workload, you can get a 5 gigahertz out of a laptop CPU or close to 5 gigahertz. Uh, do you w d use wor servers, well, big servers, to do your workloads at work? If you do, if you want to do per any performance testing, if you want to reason about it, this is our first recommendation. Buy a two CPU machine. You can go to eBay. You can go to Allegro. Uh, you can go to Amazon. Uh, Amazon. Well. <laughs> I would say look at XLease because it's going to be way cheaper. Uh, this is just a sample picture. It's, it, it's available. You can just <laughs> click it, get it next week. It costs less than a MacBook for sure. It's going to be probably more powerful for, for certain workloads <laughs> than a MacBook. <laughs> and then, well, let's have a look at something completely different. Uh, we're comparing here two two CPUs running exactly the same workload. One is a Xeon Gold 6132, which is a very current uh, generation of Intel Xeons. It has, I think, 20, 12, sorry, 20 gig megabytes of cache. It's running at 2.6 gigahertz. It can turbo to 3.5. Uh, 
And then we have in the other corner uh, Xeon E5 2697V3, so two generations uh, before. Which one do you believe will be faster, and wha how much do you, how much can you guess the other will score here? More, less, faster, slower. You're saying more, so it will be slower. Okay, that's a, that's a good guess. That's what I thought as well. And what we end up is the older CPU, one that's way cheaper. You can buy it on eBay for a few hundred quid, which means a few hundred pounds, just like that, compared to something that costs around $2,000. Seems to run the same workload in 420 seconds compared to 620 seconds. The question is, why? What's, what's happening? Well, it turns out the only difference between these two, because they are very similar chips, is a AVX instructions, obviously, support for the newer one, but then the second one has 35 megabytes of cache. And that's it. The, everything else looks very, very similar. But then who here writes software on the JVM? Most of us, I guess. At least most of us on stage. <laughs> and then Java has this amazing option called plus XX, sorry, minus XX colon plus use NUMA. If you enable that, you can get the speed of the same workload down to 320 seconds. Which means by choosing an older machine, which is very easy to do if you're dealing with different cloud providers, you have to figure out what machine sizes run on which CPUs. And then by adding just one flag to, the, to your JVM, you can speed your application rapidly. I, I would say twice is a nice speed up, especially if nothing has been done to the application. That's a very nice optimization. Yeah. Basically, I did nothing and still got paid. So the times are interesting. Uh, definitely. Definitely. Computers are very interesting, and first thing that you should take out: uh, Java can support NUMA. Use this flag. See if it makes a difference for your, for your software. Of course, if you're running within a hypervisor, within a, on a cloud, and uh, in Kubernetes, uh, and behind Spring Boot, and your workloads are I/O bound. It might not apply, as we said uh, at, at first, but if you have something that's really crunching your CPU for a few minutes at 100% or close to 100%, have, give it a look. It might change what runs and how fast it runs. Uh, for me, it was interesting. And disclaimer, uh, for the rest of the presentation, <laughs> please treat it as work report. This is what worked. This is what we have observed. Uh, this is not what you should do to your software. Please test for your software. And because this is almost immediately after lunch, you might be sleepy. Uh, a summary. <laughs> Just if you want to choose another session like the one from Jarek. Uh, hardware matters. Test on what you run. So if you have a production system, try something similar for doing development, or at least some of part of development. What, do you, what machine do you develop on? Yeah, it's a, s a desktop with uh, i7. And what do you run on in production? Well. Oh, uh, AWS? <laughs> yeah, uh, for me it's uh, it's this and then it's Azure and I get a lot of surprises. I get a lot of fun. Yeah. Do you? Sometimes, yes. There are some weird <laughs> quick quirks. Well, my workstation is definitely sh faster than production, so <laughs> it's always kind of funny to see uh, f how, how slow is the production. <laughs> so, same here. Uh, also, profilers will lie. Uh, if you're using JProfiler, if you're using your kit, it might give you numbers that might not accurately represent reality. They are useful tools, for sure, but they might misrepresent it. Benchmarks, especially JMH, might lead you to wrong conclusions. What it produces is numbers. It's up to you to verify this. Uh, if you're optimizing an, a, a production system, look at the end-to-end. -end. Techniques that you can explore, even sourcing, CQRS, algorithms, Reactive is a new thing on the blog, but it's, it runs reasonably well on paper. Uh, and if anything seems applicable, please buy a multi-CPU computer. And then let's have a look at an Azure instance, one called Standard M128S. And this is the architecture that we get. And this is funny thing about Azure. I think I got a pick. Once we did it, we've had uh, something ep epic based there, and then we started having Intels. So I won't share too many details. But what we wanted to talk about is you mentioned Threadrippers. And Threadrippers are consumer-based epics. And AMD made a design choice of going smaller dice, smaller sub-CPUs. So basically, 
the left side of here is what Intel does, and the right side is AMD. And you can see the green things, or, well, the infinity symbol. <laughs> I always forget what it's called. Infinity something. Infinity fabric. Infinity fabric, yeah. So they, those dice can talk to each other, but obviously, as you've, you've, you've seen with Numa, uh, there is some latency penalty to pay if you are crossing the infinity fabric. Some, not a lot, but a bit. Uh, so all of the dice are effectively fully, fully powered CPUs. So they, they could be just cut into into four, and you could have four, four separate CPUs. But instead, they want to deliver one package that has 32 physical cores. Uh, and you can see the important bit at the very bottom: 32 die, 32 core die costs. 60% of what a traditional one big die with everything would cost. And then we have Threadrippers, which you mentioned. Can you spot the difference between this and the Epic that we've shown you just a bit, bit of behind? Anybody? This could be worth a ticket to Spoina, by the way. <laughs> okay. So the difference is marked in color in this chalk. Speak up, speak up. Yes, this is exactly what's happening. So Threadripper is, some people say bastardized, some people say cut, limited, downscale, whatever you want to say, a uh, version of an epic. Obviously not to compete. Uh, it limits performance a bit, but you get a lot of compute units and you only half of the CPU gets direct RAM access. Those two marked in purple? Yeah, kind of, maybe. Depends on which screen you're <laughs> looking at. Uh, they don't have direct RAM access, so they have to go through an infinity fabric to get to RAM. So they have to use their neighbor, neighbor as, a, as a proxy already. And then you can have, a, what does it look if you have a dual socket, so dual physical CPU, you get four dice and it becomes a very mixed picture. And then some people, uh, especially Intel proponents, say, well, this is, this is nonsense, this is AMD's approach. But then Intel, very recently, in April, announced that their 9200 Xeon Platinum line is going to be exactly like that. Two CPUs are going to be glued together to form a bigger CPU. So glue all the way. Or a joke in Polish. Uh, uh, what does it mean to us? Uh, you cannot treat a whole CPU as a, as a thing that's linearly scales across. It's, it's, it's going to be independent units, and the, your software, if it's supposed to be efficient, should treat, as, treat it as such. <laughs> as such, yeah. So what, what makes sense to me? Which one should I run my software on? Well, obviously, the answer in IT is always, always, always. Always. It depends. <laughs> uh, somebody was kind enough to do a small cloud comparison. I'm not tell saying that this is the cloud comparison you should always follow. However, uh, it's there and somebody updates it or did update it a few times, so it's already good. So the question is now where do I test it? I have a workload, I'm running it in production or I need to choose a production, which one should I buy? Here we can say beware of something, finally. Uh, we will say beware of the clouds with an asterisk. Sometimes, under specific conditions, they might mislead you. Uh, so, here is a chart of how long does a some workload perform on a cloud, on a cloud provider. We will not tell you which provider because we, want, we don't want to start a holy war, but because two of them start with a letter A, uh, <laughs> saying it's a cloud provider A gives you nothing or close <laughs> to nothing. Uh, anything interesting in here that you can see? Nah, if not Dominika, what's, what's, what's good about this picture? Obviously, it's colorful. It's a nice slope. I think I could ski from it. Uh, <laughs> maybe the middle bit, because the top, I'm not that good of a skier. I, I, I like living. <laughs> well, the shortest uh, run and the slowest run, well, they are not close enough <laughs> to each other. The, close, the longest run is like six times more than uh, six times time more uh, than the fastest run, so it really uh, gives you. Uh, uh it <laughs> sounds like a big difference. Six times? Yeah. Six times. Uh, so, how two how hours? Twelve hours? Same cloud? Same thing? Yeah. 
Uh, why? Why can it be? Why is that so? It's a good question. Probably because there are some neighbors <laughs> on your uh, machine, so they can affect you. Uh, they can they compete for resources with you. That's can I do anything about it? Well, you can buy your own <laughs> data cloud. <laughs> that's a solution. You can buy dedicated hardware in the cloud yeah. as well. Yeah. I think s I've heard some people take a bunch of machines, do a basic performance uh, test of each, and then just throw away the slowest. It's a thing you can do, and with minute billing, that works. And I believe this is a replicated slide. Yeah. That's another interesting observation. 50% of the samples took more than 1.3 times the fastest, which means, uh, imagine you're doing performance analysis of what's happening, you've made a difference, and uh, you've made some code changes and you want to run it and you want to see what's happening. Is what you are observing the, the effect of you running on the cloud and, and s something random happening, or is it really you? Is it your the quality of, 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 uh, of the amazing work that you did? No idea. As in, without running this test a lot of times, you, you cannot statistically significantly say. 15% of the samples took twice the fastest sample. Uh, the question is, was it the only strange workload like this? And the answer is, no, that's another one. And we could give you another one, but you get the gift. You get the gist. Clouds do misbehave. It's, it, it's a known fact. They do run production reasonably well, but if you need something very repeatable, very controlled, you need to have a separate, as you said, by your own hardware for performance testing, having a peel up, having some old workstations under a desk, some especially other, uh, of a left person. Just, just, just do it. Should you stop using the cloud? Should I? Yeah, uh, I think <laughs> we'll give you an answer. I don't know. Do you know? Should they stop using the cloud? Probably, maybe. <laughs> it depends. It all depends. Uh, ch check your requirements. Uh, one talk that we have to recommend. It's an awesome talk. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> it's called How Not to Measure Latency. It's by the acting CTO of, uh, or the active CTO of Azul, uh, even though that there is a, another p person with similar role there. And because of that, it's a great time to build ABM. ABMs, agent-based models, a lot of independent entities being simulated independently. Because why? Because, ho because hardware, so we have access to a lot of cores. So if you want to simulate a game of life, and it's animating, yes. yes. Uh, if you've been to a code retweet, sorry, code retweet, I always confuse it. Uh, you've, you've retweeted all your code. Uh, it's an event in which you try to code Conway Game of Life for fi 45 minutes, experiment with various techniques, and then throw it all away. Uh, but then Conway Game of Life is, is simple enough to fit in that purpose. You know it very well. Who here has been to a code retweet? Retreat. Yeah, some people. There is something called Global Day of Code Retreat. It's usually around the end of the year. It's a fun exercise, if, especially if you've never been. Uh, what the code might look like for a game of life might be something like that. Obviously, it might be com something completely different, depends on your choice. Uh, if you're alive, if you have two or three living neighbors, uh, you live, otherwise you die. End of story. Uh, and then you simulate a whole large grid, let's say million by million or 80 million by 80 million in any language that you want. And then somebody could say, well, but you would normally do it in a different language. You could do it in C, you could do it in Python, and some people will even go to conferences and say that Python is the absolute, absolutest, bestest, fastest <laughs> test language uh, there is. Uh, sadly, do you agree? Not really. <laughs> Neither do I. Uh, I like Java and JVM-based languages. Do you? Yeah. So uh, I would uh, I would say uh, that JVM-based languages are great because they do protect us from all the hardware the divergences, as and they try to hide it within the JVM, and then the JVM vendors try to cover the differences between an Intel and an ARM and a Threadripper to some some, uh, some extent. And then requirements. What were the requirements? Have a look at your requirements. For for us, what we were looking at is optimizing wall clock time. Wall clock time is uh, the time it takes from when I click start simulation to when the <coughs> results are available. Uh, and that's that's it. Whatever happens, happens. And we have two options. One is writing numa friendly core code. So learning a lot and uh, applying it to our code. Of course, that requires knowledge. So option number two, 
Let's pretend nothing like that exists. Let's put it all into Docker, into Kubernetes, ship it onto serverless clouds and be merry. Can it work? Maybe. Uh, you can guess, guess from the amount of irony and sarcasm that we are trying to put in here is uh, for some usages you have to be aware of Numa. Uh, what can you do? Uh, log free algorithms and cache oblivious data structures. Log free means you don't lock. Uh, why? Because if you do synchronize in Java, you will ask the operating system to give you a monitor, and that takes a lot of time. Uh, especially if you have many cores, that's going to slow your everything down. And cache oblivious data structures, so data structures that don't have to have an input uh, of the size of the cache that's available to them. They will just try to operate well. The logical follow-up question is how do you learn about those? Uh, option one, you read computer science papers. There is the daily, daily paper, the morning paper. The morning paper. Uh, wh who said that? <laughs> Wave your hand who said that. Uh, you're helpful. You'll get a ticket. Uh, if you want a cup instead, of course. You get one. Choose. Choose uh, wisely. <laughs> uh, the morning paper is a newsletter that gives you a computer science paper and a summary, so we don't have to read the entire paper and go through the dryness, uh, uh, and you get to learn a lot of things. Because this hardware evolution is happening right now, there is a lot of research, and it's fun research, happening to all languages, as in Go, Java, Rust, C++, uh, C Sharp, maybe not JavaScript, but yeah. So, if you want to do a concurrent counter, what would you do? Well, I, I, I would use synchronized. I've just finished my university, I will use synchronized. <laughs> what other options? There is atomic long. You there know. is atomic long. Uh, anybody else with any an other opinion? So synchronized atomic long for a concurrent counter. Anything else? Actors. Actors. Actors is a, is a good one. Some, somebody could uh, say lock. Uh, yeah. So uh, there is a couple options. Obviously, we have not tested all of them because it's practically impossible to find all of the solutions to a problem like that because we can do something creative like using interns so that they externalize the state and then let, letting them figure it out. Uh, these numbers that we are going to show you represent something, but they are about the gist of what's happening, not about the numbers themselves, so don't pay too much attention to the numbers. Uh, more is usually better. Same shape means same benchmark. That's it. What we have here is a Threadripper. Uh, MacBook and the workstation comparing the same uh, benchmark. So what we, ha what we have here, uh, Threadripper won, but what we then learned is that Threadripper was overclocked because you can overclock Threadrippers. And you, some people, especially those who do data science, they might want to get big powerful Threadrippers and overclock them even further, do water cooling. And this is being used for a very specific thing. So you might get to work with machines like that. Uh, or in case of the Xeon, well, Xeon seems the slowest, but it can do 2S. What's 2S? Um, How many Xeons can I put in my computer? Two. For example, two. So uh, even though it looks like it's, go it's, go it's, it's slower, I can have many of those slow blocks, and I can have all of them running in a single, in, in a single machine, because two sockets is, by definition, going to be faster than uh, single socket. Nothing more interesting in here rather than the MacBook and, and the flip that you've already seen. But then let's compare to other machines. So the top of the line AMD Threadripper that has 32 cores and the 28 core CPU from Intel, the E78890V3, which co used to cost around $10,000. I would say that the difference is massive. Any guesses why? Uh, the difference is in the cache size, and for that benchmark, it, did, it really did affect it heavily. Uh, what should you do about it? Try on the hardware that resembles what you're running on. That's it. And also, there is uh, a command line thing available on Linux, not available on the Mac because Macs can Mac do multi-core, multi-CPU configurations? Do they ship I them? don't think so. Why you would they bother? <laughs> yeah. It you can get a very nice cheese grater, though, yeah. soon. Uh, but uh, you can do NUMA CTL, so you can say processes which cores they should physically use, and 
prohibit the operating system scheduler from using other cores. There is a nice li library by the Open HFT people, which is called Java Thread Affinity, which is telling the Java threads to run on specific cores and specific cores only. You can also, instead of doing a large process, have smaller processes and talking over localhost, because localhost as a network <laughs> socket where works reasonably fast for some reason. I don't, I have no idea why. <laughs> uh, you can talk over memory mapped files. So you externalize the state, but you ask the operating system to be the intermediary. And there are two example libraries that do something that uh, works with that very well. Uh, they are there in the bottom. You will get the slides, so don't worry. And now we can have a break for water. Well. <laughs> So, as we said, times are interesting. Uh, there is definitely a lot to be learned around building distributed stuff. But then, this guy always comes back when it comes to building things that are distributed. Do you know who that is? Anybody? Might you be give them a hint. Okay. <laughs> There is a nice quote by that person. A distributed system is one in which if the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. Say again? That's not creator of Erlang. Uh, so, no? Okay, that was Leslie Lamport. Uh, he wrote a lot of papers around distributed systems. The funny bit is he wrote them in the 60s, 70s. Yeah, something like that. So, uh, before that even happened. And then time. Computers can... If you have many computers, how can they coordinate time? What would you use? Well, NTP. NTP works. NTP is network time protocol, and obviously that will work, so that's, that's a good solution. And then there comes a <laughs> new computer that just came out of the blue. Maybe it was rebooted, maybe the battery in, the, in its BIOS died, and it might rep give you a time like that. And these things happen within a data center or if you have multiple data centers, coordinating operating system or time or hardware time is just difficult. To the level of time is not guaranteed to be monotonic across cores. So if you ask, if you do something like system.getTime or new date, uh, you might get different, not, not monotonic, things on the same core even though you ask at the same time. The question is, how can I make this consistent? There's obviously option one, somebody knows better. Uh, that solution always works to an extent. Uh, there are some inherent problems with that. Uh, you have to establish a protocol. Uh, who is the one entity that knows better? Uh, and I mentioned, we mentioned Leslie Alamport, and there is a nice paper. that talks about clocks that can only move in a specific direction. And if you have time as a thing in a system, you can have you can use this paper as a, as a basis. Consider system time, so the operating system, system time as something separate from what your logical pieces, piece of software uses for time input, or have a dedicated way to get time input, and uh, then have your own same, some sort of notion of, of time. Papers that we can recommend around the area. Uh, I'll leave the subjects there. And then let's take a step back. Those co computers, many computers, I have many computers. How can they talk to each other? What will they, which will, what will they use? Network. Network. So uh, if you have a switch, at the top of the rack, there is a top of the rack switch, obviously. Uh, they will usually use something like that. Uh, some sort of fancy network hardware, usually running much faster than one gigabit that you get at home. And then you might come across a benchmark that looks something like that. Can you notice anything strange here? I will help. This is the strange bit. Somebody was making a benchmark and it was bound at around 100 megabytes per second. If you say 100 megabytes times 8, that, that's around 800 megabit, or slightly over. That means that we were probably, well, A, we were on a one gigabit link, 
and we were saturating that, or B, uh, we were on something faster, but we couldn't generate more data. And then there is this awesome thing of TCP <laughs> in CAST. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> well, uh, when uh, we ask for data in um, uh, in um <laughs> something like MapReduce, we are uh, asking to uh, asking about data, and it comes uh, well from all the nodes at once. <laughs> we have a problem. <laughs> That problem, luckily, is easy to solve by buying more expensive, well, better network hardware. But that brings us to the subject of network. And with network, there is Java. There is a notion in Java that's very closely connected to using the network. Yeah, the serialization. So yeah, serialization. Uh, let's consider something simple. A game of life with a population of the, of the UK, which will be 80 million, and each of the neighbors has to send at 1,024 bytes of data, yay, we get pictures. Uh, that's around eight, 76 gigabytes of data. Uh, that means that over a gigabit connection, you will end up taking 10 minutes just to transfer this. Uh, if we switch to a 10 gigabit connection, can we assume that it will only take one minute? Yes or no? Who thinks yes? Somebody brave, okay. Uh, who is asleep? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, the answer is, uh, I don't know. I would hope that it, it should be, but it means that your software needs to be fast enough to be able to saturate a 10 gigabit link. Uh, that's not an easy requirement to, to do. Uh, obviously, if you are in that space, if, if you can saturate 10 gigabit or more, you're happy, but usually, uh, there is a culprit, and the culprit uh, that we are very frequently guilty of using is called... Oh, we so love JSON. <laughs> What's wrong with JSON? I don't know. Mm. Uh, it's readable, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> so, uh, speaking about JSON's problems will be too long, and we have a few more slides to go, so we please, please ask you from here, don't use large JSONs. If you want to run debug, sure, but then switch to something binary, because it will be faster. Just, just that, please. Uh, if you need a protocol, sorry, a, a data transfer solution that will work out of the box and will be reasonably quick and will not use JSON, uh, we give you a, a hint. This works. This works reasonably well, and it's I would call it fast. Would you? Maybe. Yeah. Why not? So give it a try. <laughs> uh, other thing. What techniques work? Well, I think event sourcing might be helpful. So event sourcing works. Why? Because you cut events, so you emit the state changes, and you emit them, and you let somebody else handle them. Uh, actors work. Somebody here mentioned actors. I think you were quite active. Do you want a ticket to Spoina? <laughs> the person who mentioned Erlang, I believe you're, you were on the right path, so ticket or, or, or mug, choose yours. And uh, uh, Reactive is something new. If you have large volumes of data, do, do reactive, because that cuts away the processing from what's, what's being done. And we did say many single-threaded processes might work for some workloads much faster than one large multi-threaded pro process. Why? Because you don't have to synchronize, you don't have to coordinate. This is effectively reinventing uh, MapReduce, <laughs> yeah. which means we're coming back to where we started almost. <laughs> so. Because we're ru almost running out of time, yeah. uh, we have to get to some conclusions, so we have something useful to, to do. First, get your basic right, right? <laughs> uh, pick your algori algorithms, do some algorithm reser research, and uh, then... Define how you measure if it works or not. And if you're measuring, <laughs> you well, you can obviously obsess about micro benchmarks of how fast the data provided, the dates getting code is. But usually, well, bigger picture is 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 is, is important. Yes. Yeah, and then we will say something uh, awkward at first. If you think that something is wrong in a certain area, make a guess. It's absolutely your your. You're right. Well, if you don't know, you have to start somewhere, which means, yeah, make a guess. Make a, make a hi hypothesis. Then, then verify. Well, try to affect it in one way, try to affect it in the other, see if it reacts the way 
it works, and then distrust results. Not throw them away, but distrust. Well, be suspect, suspicious. Suspicious. Okay. Be suspicious of the results because, well, even JMH. So the best, the one Java micro benchmarking framework that you should be using. Don't use Caliper, please. Uh, people still still do. Uh, even says that the numbers are just numbers. They might represent anything. Uh, whether they are useful. Well, they are just hints. <laughs> they might be useful. They might. They are hints. Uh, there is an another awesome talk that we have to recommend to you. And it's one by Nitsan. Profilers are lying. The word used not to be hobbitious. Uh, and there is an awesome piece of software called... The Vtune. Vtune. It runs with hardware counters. It's uh, If you need to use a, profi a, a profiler that can understand what the CPU runs, this one runs awesome. And you can see the uh, big thing... Uh, and in fourth line of text, <laughs> it's free. You don't have to pay for it. It used to be paid software. It used to be quite expensive. And you had to pay maintenance. But you don't have to s do so anymore. And I think we're running close towards the end. So yeah. uh, normally, in any self-respecting talk, we should finish with something like this. Anybody recognizes this quote? One of the Cato's, uh, and also I. Uh, on top of everything, I think Carthage should be destroyed. Ponadto uważam, że Kartagina powinna zostać zniszczona. So, yeah, but there is something better that we just found. Yeah. And this is... Yeah. Uh, service architecture is so polarized at times. Half of our industry is trying to use uh, user land TCP stacks to re reduce every ounce of latency. And the other half is using Ruby and Kubernetes and overlay networks that reduce our network performance and increases our CPU usage to 10 years ago. <laughs> ah. So we keep doing the same over and over and over and over and over. And so, summary once again, if you want to take a picture. Sure, if you have any questions, we are here. If not, thank you. Thank you, Dominika. Thank you, Andrzej. <laughs> uh, thanks. <laughs>